pray but a little and it will fail to the ruin of all. I do think, and I hope that by the end of the presentation I'm able to uh, convince you that the climate situation is hanging on the edge of a knife. We all have inherent resistances, I should say, to believing that we're in great um, peril, collective peril, and that we have ways of rationalizing ourselves out of extreme action to respond to extraordinary circumstances. We can train ourselves to take an appropriate response to an extraordinary situation and not fall into the traps of mental rationalization that happens in just an instant. We need to become sheepdogs and really take in the information that I'm going to share with you today and allow it to enter our brains and transform the rationalizations that our minds want to put up, our minds rationalize that there's going to be a way out of this crisis without extraordinary action because what we need right now is extraordinary action. So with that, let's jump right in. The first slide that I always like to share in this presentation is um, an image that gives the scale of the Earth compared to the sun. Now, of course, throughout the march, <laughs> we'll be experiencing a lot of the sun more than actually most people do. Um, but I hope that we remember to take the sun seriously because as we all probably know, beyond any other factor, it is the sun that determines what our life on earth is like, what our climate situation is like, and the sun is a colossal force. So whenever we as a species gamble with our protection from the, from the sun, whenever we might do something which would strip our planet of its inherent balance in the face of this energy dynamo, we must remember that we are, well, playing with fire hardly describes it. So real quickly, in case you're not familiar, and we need to practice, I would say, as a, as a march, we need to practice how we will be explaining the climate problem to people. The simplest way that I have found to say it, the big picture of global warming, what is it? We have an energy imbalance with the planet. Um, more energy is entering into the atmosphere and the planet system than is escaping out into space at any given moment. If we want to understand the climate, or in particular the temperature, the surface temperature of, of a planet, you first have to understand something about the connection between temperature and energy. Uh, temperature is, loosely speaking, uh, a measure of the energy content of something. Something that is hotter actually has more energy inside it. And uh, so uh, in order to determine the temperature, you need to know something about the rate at which energy goes in and the rate at which energy goes out. In 1827, it was recognized that the energy source that maintains the Earth's temperature is not energy coming up from the interior of the planet, but the sunlight that's absorbed. And so if you kept absorbing all this sunlight and you kept accumulating energy, 
then the planet would just heat up and heat up and heat up. The temperature would grow without bound until we melt it. So the other part of the equation that determines the temperature of a planet is the rate at which you lose energy. And here the key insight was that the hotter a body gets, the more rapidly it loses energy. And so you're receiving energy at more or less a fixed rate from the sun, and then the temperature builds up and builds up and builds up. The hotter it gets, the more rapidly you lose energy to space. And then bang, when, you, when what goes out equals what comes in, that's your equilibrium temperature. Um, now that's not a bad thing that helps keep us at normally in a natu in natural balance that would keep our planet habitable however we've been increasing that that energy imbalance tremendously so that we're now at the point where the amount of of energy that is um, out of balance is the same as exploding 400,000 atomic bombs every single day and real quick, another way to understand this is um, there is always one, so the, the atmosphere is tremendously thin. Again, this is our protection from the full onslaught of energy from the sun. If the earth were the size of an apple, the whole atmosphere would be as only as thick as the apple's skin. There's always a layer, uh, an altitude in the atmosphere where the temperature is where the energy balance is balanced, where the amount coming in is the same as the amount going out and the temperature is always steady at that altitude. And what we're essentially doing is forcing that altitude higher out into space. On most days, um, under most conditions, the atmosphere is far too thick, far too opaque for this infrared radiation to escape directly to space. And this is the thing people have to understand. The atmosphere looks completely different in the infrared. If we were wearing goggles, which only allowed us to see in the wavelengths that the Earth uses to shed energy to space, we wouldn't be able to see very far. We'd barely be able to see 200 yards to that, the college over there. But the higher up you go, the more tenuous the atmosphere gets, the, the thinner it is. So there's less greenhouse gas there just because there's less gas of any sort. And so there's always some level where the atmosphere finally becomes thin enough that the radiation can escape to space. And that is called a radiating level. And that level is colder than the ground because the higher up you go up to a certain point, the colder it gets. And that is called a radiating temperature of the planet. If you looked at the planet from space, would, it would look as if the planet had a temperature of minus 18 degrees. That's, what the, that's the temperature, in fact, we would have if we had no atmosphere. But in fact, of course, we have a blanket of greenhouse gases surrounding the Earth. What you see from space is the top of that blanket, so to speak, which, just like a real blanket, can be much colder than the bottom. So where we are, underneath this blanket, is a nice comfortable 15 degrees on average. No matter how much greenhouse gas we add to the atmosphere, we, we will not in the long term change the radiating temperature of the planet because the radiating temperature is determined by the requirements of energy balance. So if the Earth is radiating at a temperature of minus 20 Celsius today in round numbers, uh, then uh, even after adding a lot of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, it will still, once it comes back into balance, be radiating minus 20. When we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we are not primarily changing the radiating temperature. What we're changing is the radiating altitude. The more greenhouse gas you stuff in the atmosphere, the higher you have to go before the atmosphere is thin enough to let the infrared radiation escape to space so that the atmosphere is radiating to space from a higher altitude than it used to be, so that the temperature at the radiating level, which is still, let's say, minus 20, remains at minus 20, but, it's, but that temperature is occurring higher up. And since the, the temperature, or the rate of temperature increase as you go deeper in the atmosphere is approximately fixed, but you're starting at that minus 20 from higher up, by the time you extrapolate to the ground, you wind up with a higher temperature.
on the average, the temperature goes down about six degrees with each kilometer that you go up. And so we can ask the question, how much higher do we have to push that level in order to get, say, a two degree warming at the surface? Well, to get a six degree warming, you would push that radiating level up by one kilometer. To get a two degree warming at the surface, you only need to push it up about a third that much, which is in round numbers, 300 meters. It takes relatively little increase in the infrared murkiness of the atmosphere to uh, change the uh, altitude uh, at which infrared escapes to space by a mere 300 meters. And that's, that's part of why the climate is so sensitive to greenhouse gas concentration. So, what will we be encountering as we go marching? I say, from our experience, uh, actually doing our walking project, long distance walking project, and uh, generally talking to people, this is what we have found. The mainstream view out there is that yes, people are starting, the majority of people understand the climate change is serious, um, but most people are thinking we finally understand the problem now. And that is a problem in itself because what we have found is that most people don't actually have a strong sense of how climate change works or how the degree of the emergency that we're in. In fact, Stanford did a, a small study last year where they surveyed I think it was about 275 people and only 12% of those could even identify that greenhouse gases had something to do with the climate problem and uh, of that not a single one could explain the mechanism by which global warming happens. So there's a still a trem tremendous bubble of ignorance out there. However, people hear that our government is finally starting to do things that we have better standards for automobile, uh, better efficiency standards for automobiles, trucks. We are decreasing our use of coal, so even though it is still the uh, single largest source of energy production in our country, it's, it's dropped, um, its percentage of our energy supply has dropped considerably. Uh, hugely increased use of natural gas through fracking, which of course is a divisive issue in itself. We have um, actually grown uh, a, a tremendous amount of capacity to power ourselves by wind and solar, uh, especially in the last seven years. And the EPA has finally granted its, um, the right to regulate CO2 under the Clean Air Act. The federal government has a mandate to reduce carbon emissions by 18% by 2020 and 80% by 2050. The federal government has a mandate to consider the impact on climate change when performing environmental assessments on any project that involves uh, the federal government. And um, we, have, we are finally participating, non-binding agreement, but we have an international agreement to limit global warming rise to two degrees C, two degrees Celsius above where temperatures were at before industry. Uh, and virtually every country on Earth is a signatory uh, to that agreement. And on the local level, cities and states are forming climate task forces preparing to adapt to changing conditions. And, it, and what we hear, what people have heard, is that the U.S. has been reducing its emissions since 2006. On the other hand, People are hearing more and more stories about how the extreme weather events that we're experiencing are tied to climate change. So temperatures have risen uh, almost one degree Celsius, about 0.85 now, um, since industry began uh, 150 years ago. Most of that happened in the last 30 years. And so we're at 0.8 say 0.8 degrees C and what's happening on the earth. The east coast is being pummeled with the power of a record-breaking superstorm. Oh my god, it's washing everything away! The floodwaters still die across vast areas of the country. Road and rail and telephone communications have been cut. Water wells have been contaminated 
And so, ironically, there's a severe shortage of pure drinking water. In December, three states, Tasmania, New South Wales and Victoria, battled major bushfires which burnt through thousands of hectares of scrub. January was the hottest January on record. There were seven days running where the average daily maximum for the country was more than 39 degrees. Just weeks later, Queensland and much of northern New South Wales were underwater as record rainfalls caused extensive flooding. As Russia's firefighters battle the flames, its farmers say they're reaping the worst harvest in years. Crops in these fields around Voronezh in central Russia have all but withered in the searing heat. Russia's long, sweltering summer is wrecking lives and livelihoods. Almost 95% of the state is enduring extreme or exceptional levels of drought. And since last week, those areas suffering the most jumped from roughly 14% to more than 35%. With fields withering and ponds drying up, about two inches of rain total, farmer Rusty Lee has already lost much of his squash and corn crop. He stands to lose more if he doesn't get help. Uh, we're having super cyclones like Hurricane Sandy and uh, Typhoon Bofa and um, I'm forgetting Haiyan. Typhoon Haiyan um, are happening with increasing frequency. As you recall, in 2012, we had our tremendous heat wave where 40,000 U.S. daily temperature records were broken just by June of 2012 and we also entered into a drought that affected 36 states were declared in a state of emergency and that drought continues to this day for large parts of the country including of course California. I believe it has three years now that running that we have a food deficit on the planet that is we're consuming more than we have a backstock for so we're actually running out of food on the planet. Deserts are increasing across the world. Um, Two-thirds of the Earth's land mass are turning into desert now. This is all still at 8 degrees, 0.8 degrees C. <laughs> uh, you're all aware of the Arctic sea ice is decreasing in size. It had a catastrophic low in 2007 and then a new record low in 2012 and it's expected that we might be might have an entirely ice-free um, Arctic Ocean by 2015 perhaps. And it's not just the sea ice, the land ice and, and land snow is decreasing. The glaciers are shrinking uh, both in Greenland and in Antarctica. They're not melting like a single cube of ice like they were originally modeled. They're melting much faster from the top and from the bottom. When I saw that glacier dying, it was like, wow, you know, we, uh, if a glacier that's been here for 30,000 years or 100,000 years is literally dying in front of my eyes, you're very aware of the fact that you know, sometime you, uh, <clears throat> sometime you go out over the horizon and you don't come back. This isn't a 10-foot little hole in the ground. It's 100 feet deep into an abyss. And if you don't have that, that little dot of a person for scale, then it's lost. And it's
This Mulan is one of thousands of Mulans all over the melt zone in Greenland. And every day, the ice is cooking down and water is pouring into the ice sheet. It's enormous. You can't wrap your head around how much water is coming off of this place. Looks like the surface of the moon. Look at those holes. Oh my gosh, look at this stuff. I had no idea it was so thick in here. This stuff, this cryokonite, it's made from a combination of natural dust that blows in from the deserts of Central Asia, mixed with uh, little flakes of carbon, fine particles of soot that come from wildfires, diesel exhaust, and coal-fired power plants. And on top of it, there's algae that grows out here. And all of that stuff accumulates in these little holes. And because it's black, it absorbs the sun's heat more than the surrounding ice does. And all over the surface of the ice sheet, there's literally billions of these little cryokonite holes melting away and filling up with water. And when you look down in those holes, you can actually see these little bubbles of ancient air being released as the ice sheet melts. So how big was this calving event that we just looked at? We'll resort to some illustrations again to give you a sense of scale. It's as if the entire lower tip of Manhattan broke off, except that the thickness, the height of it, is equivalent to buildings that are two and a half or three times higher than they are. That's a magical, miraculous, horrible, scary thing. I don't know that anybody's really seen the miracle and horror of that. It took a hundred years for it to retreat eight miles from 1900 to 2000. From 2000 to 2010, it retreated nine miles. So in 10 years, it retreated more than it had in the previous 100. This is another um, tremendous problem that we are all experiencing so far just with the climate change that we have, the acidification of the ocean. He took me to meet Charlie Verne, the godfather of coral, a guy who's named at least a quarter of all the world's coral species, knows reefs better than anybody, and he said the big problem is ocean acidification. Much of the carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere doesn't stay in the atmosphere. It gets absorbed by the oceans. The oceans are the greatest regulator of climate, of water, and of carbon on the planet. And the oceans, because of our carbon dioxide release, are 30% more acidic than they were before the Industrial Revolution. A few percent change in the acidity of your body will kill you. And we've made the oceans 30% more acidic. And in a more acidic environment, anything in the ocean that builds skeletons is going to have trouble. And what builds skeletons in the oceans? Coral reefs, fish phytoplankton, the animals that give us 50 to 80 percent of the oxygen that we breathe. Charlie told me that four out of the five mass extinctions in the past, 500 million years, that have wiped most life off planet Earth have been caused by ocean acidification. And we're now causing the oceans to go acidic faster than in three out of four of those extinctions. All of this is happening in the last 250 million years. And we didn't know about this when the whole climate change thing started because ocean acidification was only discovered about eight years ago when chemists and biologists sat in the same room. They compared notes and ran out of the room barfing because of how disturbing it was. The ocean uh, is uh, the primary absorber of the extra energy that's kept around the planet in global warming. Most of it goes into the oceans first, lingers there, and then comes out about 30 years later. And... Uh, but, but it's not just that the oceans are warming up, they also are directly absorbing a large part of our carbon dioxide emissions, which interacts chemically in the oceans to form carbonic acid. 
the deep ocean contains about 60 times more carbon dioxide than the whole of the atmosphere does. And it's this huge reservoir, this huge pool of carbon, of carbon dioxide. In a nutshell, the, the temperature and the salinity of the ocean control how much carbon dioxide can get stored and dissolves in, in the ocean's surface. And a cold ocean allows more carbon dioxide into it. You can think maybe about molecules bouncing around less. It makes it a kind of more attractive environment for a gas to uh, slip down into. And the way that it absorbs that is, is a function of a, a kind of whole set of processes. It's due to waves in the ocean. As waves break over, they can push down bubbles, and, and that's one process that helps take gases into the ocean. It's due to the life in the, the surface of the ocean and how much, uh, in particular, photosynthesis goes on right in the surface there. These organisms are really the invisible forests of the ocean. They're acting as sponges for carbon dioxide, and yet we just don't see them very well with the naked eye. But there are millions. In, in, in one milliliter of seawater, there can be between 10,000 to a million cells. They're phenomenal in scale. They have this incredible impact on the carbon cycle, more so even than the forests that we can see and walk around in. But because of the individual cellular size, we don't appreciate their importance. So life plays a really important role in pumping carbon dioxide down into the deep ocean, something that's it's often called the biological pump. The ocean is absorbing, in the very surface of it, about a third of the carbon dioxide that we're emitting into the atmosphere. But less and less of that carbon dioxide will get absorbed into the ocean as we continue to heat the world up. And so, as less gets absorbed, more carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere, which makes it warmer, which makes the ocean warmer, which means even less gets absorbed. So you start to see these kind of feedback mechanisms, which are some of the really scary parts of modern global warming. It is expected that corals will be gone by mid-century, if not sooner, if we don't do something. So, people hear all this disruption, they may have seen J Dr. James Hansen, one of our chief climatologists in this country. He used to work for NASA until recently when he retired so that he could become more of an activist about the climate, and he was uh, one who brought the global warming emergency to Congress's attention in 1980. He was on, his team produced a paper in 2012 where he showed that um, uh, extreme weather events are occurring a hundredfold more frequently than in the past, like 50 years from 1950 to um, 1980. Now, an event that would have been a 1 in 1,000 chance of happening is more a 1 in 10 chance of happening. And it also covers a hundredfold more land area when it does happen. What you see on the right is perhaps an explanation for this. Um, the chief meteorologist for the Weather Channel, Stu Ostro, has introduced a hypothesis which is now being peer-reviewed that um, he noticed uh, in direct response to the global warming signal, the air masses that direct our weather systems, which is the pressure masses around 500 millibars, are growing taller in the atmosphere and they're becoming more stable. So you have these really tall, long-lasting ridges of higher pressure and then deep troughs next to them. and they are persisting. So for instance, what's happening in California is there has been a high pressure dome sitting off of California, off the coast of California for months and months on end, um, more than one year now, and is preventing the usual 
low pressure rain systems from coming on shore and it's causing a drought. What you see on the screen is another uh, anomaly from last year, from 2013, perhaps the first time this was ever seen. The large purple circle is a high pressure dome, again reaching much higher into the atmosphere than these systems, than this um, air mass usually does. And it's, and it's persisting. It's actually driving a low pressure system, which is the green and blue small circle, from the east to the west, instead of our usual weather pattern from west to east. And these are the sorts of anomalies that we're starting to see just with one degree of change, or even less than one degree C of change. So when people hear about this, the people that will be meeting on the march, they have to reconcile all the things that they hear that our country is doing to address the climate situation at long last with the news that the climate situation is, is worsening rapidly. And, and how do they reconcile that? Well, the mainstream interpretation that they're given is we're doing our part, which is Americans are doing our part. The U.S. is on board to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 80%, as I said, by 2050. And we've already started. So if there's a problem, it will be others' fault, like the people in India and China. And there's nothing that we can do very much about it. Uh, and they also hear that we are working the solutions through the political system, the court system, and the economic system. We will turn this around and implement the green revolution at long last and we'll pull it out of the fire before it's too late. Our elected leaders are, are cottoning on to how this is a problem. So basically what we as average Americans have to do is just sit back and wait and buy green, go green, be green consumers. Well, we need a reality check to that story. Global emissions of greenhouse gases are rising two to three times faster than assumed in the worst case scenarios of the international panel, intergovernmental panel on climate change. It, so when they imagined countries around the world basically not giving a damn about the climate and continuing industry full tilt. They imagined how fast our emissions would be arising and we're exceeding that by two to three times. The U.S. has not turned the corner on its emissions. We've primarily offshored them to China. China, if you took the emissions in China that are a direct result of manufacture for, for export to the U.S. and put it into our emissions tally instead. We would not, we didn't turn the corner in 2006. We're just having them take the blame and the responsibility for our excessive manufacture. Reality check. Stopping the temperature rise at the 2 degrees C mark that we have an international binding agreement for is virtually impossible at this point. And I will explain to you later why that is the case. The current climate forcing, as I said, due to greenhouse gas emissions is at least five times the amount needed to generate the most major climate changes in Earth's history. Some of what we're putting out with industry is actually um, offsetting global warming and cooling the planet. That's mostly in the form of particulates and aerosols that form a bit of a sunshade on the planet. But the difficulty is that those only stay up in the air for a few weeks. So if we were to shut off industry today, those would fall out of the air within a month or a couple months. And... Um, but the CO2 that's warming the planet has a warming effect for centuries. So what we would actually see is a sudden bump in the global warming signal because we would no longer be offsetting it uh, with our other industrial emissions.
that is a huge problem that is hardly ever talked about in the mainstream. Here you can see on the left, this uh, in case we certainly will meet people on the march who are skeptical that human beings are actually capable of causing this kind of emergency on the planet. It is well established science now that carbon dioxide is by far the largest climate forcing factor now, much greater than uh, even methane, much greater than sun, solar radiation, volcanoes, uh, none of that. The question of whether or not greenhouse gases are causing global warming is completely uninteresting to a physicist. Of course they're causing global warming. So if you it turns out that the theory of global warming, the greenhouse effect, was all worked out some time ago. If all we knew was that greenhouse gas levels were going up, and supposing we, we didn't have any record of temperatures over the past 50 years, we would still expect, as physicists, the world to be warming as a result. Uh, and here you can see what I was talking about. This, this, long, this large cooling factor is our reflective aerosols that are coming out from our industry, too, that offsetting a large part of the... Um, warming signal. Radicals work at oil companies. If you are willing to get up in the morning and amass an enormous fortune altering the chemical composition of the atmosphere, then you are engaged in an act more radical than any human before you. And it is our job to stand up to that, to break that kind of radicalism before they break the planet. <laughs> would end Pakistan's drinking water crisis. As U.S. President Chelsea Clinton refuses Africa's demand. Special sales of air conditioning units in India. As San Francisco's extraordinary heat wave continues into Los Angeles. Now we're seeing extreme weather events somewhere on the planet every single day. Estimated 35 million Chinese refugees. Seeing in the Alps is over. New Channel 4 documentary asks, is global warming really happening or are natural... It's 51 degrees centigrade, the highest land temperature. More than 100 million people are homeless tonight as methane emissions from Siberia. The last Indonesian tree fell. But biofuel prices are... The European Union today permanently closed all of its borders. ...ways and roadside verges must be reserved for food production. London is underwater again as last night's 30-foot storm surge overcame the Thames Barrier. New Zealand has also now closed its borders, leaving 22 million Australians. Reports coming in that the North Sea is boiling. 100 million refugees from Middle East and continental Europe are all heading... ...more north. species are now extinct, scientists estimate, and ecosystem are collapsing across the planet. Two degrees. You cannot now stop runaway climate change. There are simply too many people to feed, and islands remain farmland. Suicide rates increasing 800 percent. The Amazon rainforest is still burning. And anyone who cannot bear to eat their own cats and dogs. Really entering the eighth world food crisis. With world temperatures today passing four degrees. Pakistan has launched retaliatory nuclear strike on today. People aren't being told the truth and in that gap between what's actually happening with the climate and what people in the mainstream hear about the climate is a loophole through which industry is plotting its future. So here's the reason why 2 degrees C is virtually impossible anymore. These are two researchers, Kevin Anderson and Alice Bose. 
uh, from the Tyndall Center for Climate Research in Manchester, England, um, and they are published by the Royal Society. They did a paper in 2008 and revised it again in 2011, and I believe again in 2013, where they're looking at breaking down the, the emissions curve for what we would have to do worldwide to keep to, uh, to limit global warming to 2 degrees C and breaking it down into two groups. Uh, one group for countries like China and India, Ukraine, Venezuela that are um, burgeoning economies based primarily on fossil fuels and then the other group countries like us and, and Canada, Australia, to some degree Europe that are established economies um, and uh, you know with a long history of fossil fuel use and so what you see is they they gave the best assumptions possible they gave the best benefit of the doubt possible for improving the situation on deforestation and reforestation and um, and social organization around these emissions issues and they they looked at the red line indicates what when that first group the China India group might reach peak emissions of greenhouse gases and the blue line indicates how countries like ours would have to respond now you can see that if if China and India wait to reach their peak emissions by even so soon as 2025, then the US and Canada and Australia, etc., have to reduce their emissions not by 18% by 2020, but by 6 to 8% per year. And they had to start that in 2010. We're nowhere near that mark. And if China and India wait until as late as 2030 to reach peak emissions, then we have to have, and that's the far right, far right chart, we have to have an infinite drop, that is an immediate, complete cessation of, of greenhouse gas emissions in this country. Not a single coal plant, not a single natural gas well not a single fleet of automobiles can be emitting carbon dioxide anymore and obviously that's not possible yes China is building um, they are one of perhaps the largest I believe they are the largest investor in solar energy to date at the same time, they are building a whole um, set of large coal farms to deal with the fact that they have tr uh, smog, overpowering smog issue in their cities. They're building these huge coal farms where they're planning to turn coal into syngas and generate uh, electricity from, from this gasified coal. So they're, they're nowhere near the point where they're going to turn the corner at 2030. In fact, when Kevin Anderson went to China and talked to a bunch of engineers there, they said, we're gonna, we might hit our peak at 2030, but we're going to stay up there for probably a few decades. All that's to say that we really stand no chance of sticking a landing at 2 degrees C. In fact, this, to do this would only give us a 50% chance of staying at 2 degrees, and we can't even do this. So international bickering and international agreements about 2 degrees are, are useless, are fluff. They, they, they don't, they're not informed by science. So if we're not going to stick to 2 degrees, where are we going and what can the march do about where we're going? How can the march change the mainstream story and, and empower people to do something once they have the reality check? 
I, I think it's really important that the Climate March understand this and, and deliver this message to the people that we meet, that there are two different kinds of problem. And I've represented it on the left with the check engine light that might come on in your car and on the right with a, a runaway stagecoach. So on the left, we have the kind of problems that I suppose we're more familiar with, which is if the check engine light comes on in your car, you know that theoretically you're supposed to take it right in, stop driving and take it right into your mechanic and have him find out what's going wrong. But we also have the idea that we can drive for a while with the check engine light on, and if something goes wrong, the mechanic, when they get to it at a later date, simply has to maybe fix something a bit more or replace a part that they didn't have to replace before at the worst. But that whatever damage happens, um, if it's cumulative damage, it can be cumulatively undone about as easily as it was as it was generated in the first place. The climate is not that kind of problem. And people often think it is that kind of problem, and that's part of the knowledge gap that we have in this country. The climate is more like the runaway stagecoach, where each piece of the coach that flies off um, spooks the horses that much more, so they run faster. That's the feedback loops that are, that are also not talked about often in the mainstream view of the climate crisis. The feedback loops that could kick in in the next 10 years take the climate beyond our ability to actually reverse the situation and in fact it may so a number of very credible and smart thinkers think it may already be too late but if we're going to operate on the assumption that we can do something about it then we also have to understand that this is the very last moment we have less than four years, and I will explain why that is the case in a little bit, but we have less than four years to redirect our social program to curb our disastrous use, overuse of fossilized carbon, or we're going to contribute to an, uh, a runaway feedback situation that is going to set the planet's climate out of anything that we have experienced for uh, millennia to come. You're starting to see news stories and, and policy reviews, prognostications about how to deal with a planet that is plus six degrees C, six degrees hotter on average than it was before industry. And according to Barry Brook, who's an award-winning professor from the University of Adelaide in Australia, a plus six degree world means most of life on Earth will die, 90% or more. Um, there's a very good chance that the oceans will stagnate and we might have a methane hydrate explosive release because methane hydrate forms in stagnant oceans. near worldwide deserts, um, extreme storms of the type that we have never even had in human history, hypercanes, you know, things that sound like science fiction. But this is what we're talking about by the end of the century. We cannot go there. The march has to decide how unreasonable, how demanding are we going to be to make sure that this isn't accepted as something that we can adapt to, as a future that we can adapt to, and, and as an, an inevitability. Because if it's an inevitability, we're all dead. James Hansen, again, last year, end of last year, October, produced a paper that said, uh, th that claims that if we burn all available fossil fuels, 
if we allow industry to continue with this unethical exploration of carbon and the um, not paying for it, you know, externalizing the cost to the environment of burning it, we're not just facing a six degree rise by the end of the century, we could be facing a 16 to 20 degree C rise. And the Arctic might itself, which I, as I said, experiences the greatest climate change, might rise an incredible 30 degrees C. And this is because of the feedback loops that I was talking about um, that are especially happening in the Arctic right now, as I'm about to tell you. However, it's important that you understand that this is the breaking edge of science. So a number of people that we speak to are going to claim that this is not well enough substantiated, that the IPCC does not talk about this stuff yet. My response to that is that James Hansen is not an extremist. He's not an alarmist. In fact, he has always been one of the more conservative climate scientists that we have. And most of his predictions have been right on the money. And what we have seen over the past two decades is that the extreme um, predictions have migrated to the, the mainstream, the median expectations now. So these may seem extreme, but they're not unplausible. And if we're going to have a, a rational and powerful response, a triage response to deal with this emergency, then we have to look at what, would, what are we going to do if this kind of scenario is the case. For instance, I said that 50 million years ago the temperature went to plus 6 degrees. It actually went all the way at least to 12 degrees um, above the average of the last 10,000 years. Now, in that event, which people have studied uh, extensively to try and get a sense of what might happen in the world if we released a similarly huge amount of carbon as happened 55 million years ago, they assume that this, this uh, extreme release of carbon happened maybe over 5,000 years or 10,000 years, then this past fall, a team from Rutgers University found they took a coarse sediment of an ancient seabed in New Jersey and it happened to have clay sediments that were very clearly defined uh, into rings, annular rings, one for each year, each season cycle. And so they were able to very finely measure how rapidly this carbon accumulation in the atmosphere happened. And it wasn't over 5,000 years or 10,000 years. It happened in 13 years. The planet went into catastrophic runaway greenhouse effect in just 13 years. There is a threshold out there that we will cross if we are not careful where the same event will happen again. Because the only plausible explanation we have for why this happened, where is why this happens on the planet is there are there's methane which is an even more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, much more powerful, trapped in, in frozen ice on the seabeds and also in the permafrost of the Arctic. the total amount of methane in the atmosphere, in the current atmosphere. It's about five gigatons. The amount of carbon of preserved 
um, in form of methane in this supernoctic shelf is approximately from hundreds to thousands of gigatons. And of course, it's only 1% of that uh, amount is required to double the atmospheric burden of methane. But the, to destabilize 1% of this carbon pool, I think it's not much effort needed, considering that the state of permafrost and the amount of methane currently involved. Because the, what uh, divides this methane from the atmosphere is a very shallow water column and a weakening permafrost, which is losing its ability to seal, uh, to serve as a seal. And this is, I think it's a matter of, it's not a matter of thousands of years, it's a matter of decades, I think. Not any time, I think, uh, any time sounds like it might happen today, it might happen tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. You think so? I'm a no, but Igor is a very convinced person because he spent, uh, spent a lot of time over there. And where the sea ice should be about 2 meters thick, it was 40 centimeters thick. That means that the processes, the, all the processes that serve, that serve destabilization of everything, of the sea ice, of the water column of the, the currents increasing, the currents, I mean the movement of water beneath the sea ice increased. So everything, everything looks anomalous. My family lives in the heartland of the U.S. and we could be experiencing summer temperatures, average summer temperatures, in the 120s to 130s with extremes up to 140 and more. By the way, that climate departure date for most of the U.S. is 2047. We talked to the researchers behind that research and they, they said that they used IPCC data which is not taking into account all of the feedback loops that we know about and it's more likely to be 2037 as 10 years sooner if not sooner than that when we reach climate departure. So I mentioned that we only have four years left to turn this around. The reason I say that is that in 2011, the International Energy Agency put out a um, comprehensive report called the World Energy Outlook. And they said, after the most extensive study ever conducted of the total world energy economy, the IEA has announced that we have four years left to reinvent our pattern of energy consumption or the financial investment in fossil fuel infrastructure will be such that by 2017, if we haven't created room in the atmospheric carbon budget, then everything that is a carbon polluter on the planet will be enough to carry us to four degrees C. We are approaching the point of no return where the planet goes into a greenhouse, a runaway greenhouse effect. Now this isn't to say that it's going to become Venus. It's somewhere out there in the future, this point of no return. And we are fast encroaching upon it and the way that the climate system works because it's nonlinear dynamics, um, we may never know exactly when we are upon that point. And once we reach it, we will not be able to retract ourselves no matter how hard we try so we have to do our effort now we have to be as aggressive as we possibly can in this next handful of years how are we going to stop business as usual so I say to you that the climate march has a choice we can support 
and lend our weight and tell people about the politically and economically viable climate stabilization efforts that are commonly talked about in the mainstream. Like I said, the car efficiency improvements, the home efficiency improvements, uh, green, green consumerism, um, a, even some things like a, a carbon tax, but a moderate politically acceptable carbon tax. All of these would be things that that might pass muster with the political in the political world and get votes behind it, and and the, econo the economists won't balk too much. However, most of those are not going to stop the climate emergency that we have. Then we have climate stabilization efforts that are most likely to be effective, and that's only cumulatively. Um, you know, Doctor. Kevin Anderson is very clear about this. In his view, we need an economic downturn. We need to stop the growth of our world's economies now, especially, as I said, countries like the US, um, Canada, Australia, etc. So there's a very narrow intersection where those two meet because most of those extreme most of those efforts that will actually stand a chance of stabilizing the climate are not politically or economically viable we never get them through the political system within the next four years and the economists will say that it will put too many people out of work and that it will cost too much so I, the March has to decide whether it wants to be scientifically real, go with scientific reality, or with political reality. talk action plan so it seems pretty clear that the first thing that we need to do is get a significant part of the population on board with the actual climate science of what's unfolding at least to a degree where they can understand that there is an emergency unfolding that they haven't really been apprised of before um, as an analogy you can imagine the mariner on the ship looks out to the horizon and sees a squall line uh, on the horizon. He doesn't think that the squall line is going to take a long time to reach to where he is. In fact, the darker the clouds, he knows the faster the storm is coming in. Our storm is coming in a lot faster than uh, most people realize, and we need to catch them up to speed so that they can move through the steps of acceptance and grief and anger and ultimately come to a place of readiness to do whatever we can do about it without a sense of inhibition. We're going to need a multi-pronged approach to solve this. And we need lots and lots of people to do the standard work that cultures of resistance do. We also need to repair the vast biotic communities that have been destroyed. This work will involve huge numbers of people in many different organizations, all of them above ground and nonviolent. So uh, local economies, participatory democracy, systems of justice, that character building, and ultimately, of course, there's direct support for the frontline actionists. And we need to really think outside the box. We need our environmentalists, our uh, activists, people who have been engaged in progressive action to really throw out the book of what is taboo or, or what we are unwilling to do and look at everything with a fresh eye. We need warriors who will put themselves between 
what is left of this planet and fossil fuel. We need to stop industrial civilization. Now that could be done nonviolently. If we had enough people, we could shut this party down by midnight using human blockades. The problem is, I don't see the numbers, not anywhere. I would love to be wrong. I would vastly prefer to wage this struggle nonviolently, but my longing will not bring forth the necessary numbers. So given a realistic assessment of what we actually have, the only viable strategy left that I can see is direct attacks against infrastructure. In the plainest terms, we need to stop them. The vast majority of people aren't going to resist shit, and I think we just need to accept that. Um, of those that do, it's still only a tiny number that ever take up those frontline positions. That's actually true in regular armies. It's only about 2% that have the direct combat roles. The other 98% do support. too late to be a pessimist. I've seen agriculture on a human scale. It can feed the whole planet if meat production doesn't take the food out of people's mouths. I've seen fishermen who take care of what they catch and care for the riches of the ocean. I have seen houses producing their own energy. 5,000 people live in the world's first ever eco-friendly district in Freiburg, Germany. Other cities partner the project. Mumbai is the thousandth to join them. The governments of New Zealand, Iceland, Austria, Sweden, and other nations have made the development of renewable energy sources a top priority. I know that 80% of the energy we consume comes from fossil energy sources. Every week, two new coal-fired generating plants are built in China alone. But I have also seen, in Denmark, a prototype of a coal-fired plant that releases its carbon into the soil rather than the air. A solution for the future? Nobody knows yet. I have seen, in Iceland, an electricity plant powered by the Earth's heat, geothermal power. I have seen a sea snake lying on the swell to absorb the energy of the waves and produce electricity. I have seen wind farms off the coast of Denmark that produce 20% of the country's electricity. The USA, China, India, Germany, and Spain are the biggest investors in renewable energy. They have already created over two and a half million jobs. Where on earth doesn't the wind blow? I have seen desert expanses baking in the sun. Everything on earth is linked and the earth is linked to the sun, its original energy source. Can humans not imitate plants and capture its energy? In one hour, the sun gives the earth the same amount of energy as that consumed by all humanity in one year. As long as the earth exists, the sun's energy will be inexhaustible. All we have to do is stop drilling the earth and start looking to the sky. All we have to do is learn to cultivate the sun. All these experiments are only examples, but they testify to a new awareness. They lay down markers for a new human adventure based on moderation, intelligence, and sharing.